Um, yeah, I'm a specialty doctor in spiritual medicine, a clinician who codes. I'm one of the board members for NHS PyCon. I've just been elected onto the Faculty of Clinical Informatics Council just today, this morning. So I'm quite excited about giving that opportunity to push forward the digital agenda and, you know, building clinical informatics as a specialty for everyone. I'm also on the cohort for a digital academy, a digital leadership course. Um, off we go. So we're going to talk about the lung cancer, the disease, we're going to talk about the user experience, we're going to talk about the digital architecture, the whole stack. So lung cancer is the fourth leading um, killer in the UK. It was the third, but then COVID came along, we kicked it down one or two pegs. Um, it's the fifth, I think, this month. Anyway, it's fourth and fifth at the moment after COVID's come along. Uh, oh, I can see people adding their names to this um, the spreadsheet as we talk. And this is a look of the data for treat, uh, referral to treatment times in Gloucestershire. And the, the current um, recommended uh, treatment time is before 62 days. And you can see that the point out there is quite a few laggards. 38% um, of patients that are treated are post 62 days. And the reason why this is important because A, it's a national standard, B, also longer treatment times lead to worse prognosis for patients. Good. Um, so I'm also a sleep specialist. Um, and so I wanted to compare my sleep work, which I've automated and that runs pretty much by itself apart from the clinics uh, against uh, lung cancer. So there's nine steps for sleep. You don't have to read all these boxes, but there's nine boxes here. The patient feels sleep, they see the GP, they have a sleep study, they see in clinic, they've started on treatment. Now for um, lung cancer, there's quite a few more steps. Now I know there's not 34 to 84 steps on this slide here and you won't be able to read all the boxes, but that bigger box, I don't think my mouse will actually show it, but the little bigger box that just offset from the center um, is where all the bits happen. You have lots of different investigations that can happen. X-rays, um, camera tests down the lungs, lung function tests, bloods, ECGs, and so on. And each of those things adds another three or four steps for the patient, referral letters go out, um, the patient needs to have the test, the test needs to be reported and so on. So there's quite a few things and then you need to refer on to um, other colleagues, thoracic surgeons and so on. In Gloucestershire, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but I presume this is just the same problem. There's 15 different systems that we have to use to actually get a patient from A to B, from referral to treatment. Now, I, didn't, I don't say digital because in the top right, there's paper as well, but 15 different systems. And I won't go through these in detail because I want to actually get to the digital architecture, what Nick and Joe's been talking about. And I have given this talk before um, at the Let's Talk Digital um, conference. So you can see a bit more detail about these things if you want to get into further detail there. And there's 15 different specialities that we have to liaise with and the patient. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. So lots of stuff that could be automated. And I love automating, I love writing code. I'm, I've automated my whole house. Uh, and um, so I, I looked at all the steps in the lung cancer pathway, spoke with my colleagues about it. And here's a list of potential things that we could automate. And it's not a complete list and just a quick list. And just to get, it's more to give you a number of things that we already think about we can automate, getting the referral from the GP, at the moment, there's a very manual process to that, or actually outcoming clinics, recording MDT, so multidisciplinary team meetings, um, checking for when results are back. We have lung cancer coordinators who do that. They spend eight to 12 hours each a week just looking at results, going onto the system, logging onto it, looking at the result, finding out if it's back or not. If it's back, then emailing a clinician to say it's back, and then they have to look at it. Why not automate that? I mean, that's lots of time that can save there. Lots of things we can um, change. I won't go into that now because I want to get to the next, uh, you know, the digital uh, architecture stuff. Um, so this brought us to a, I have to say this proof of concept, but if someone wants to have it in their trust, me, Nick and Joe would be happy to come along and install it for you. But at the moment it's a proof of concept, trying to get the user experience and make, you know, um, making sure we're building something that's useful for the user. Uh, the clinicians, the admin staff, and so on. And this is the logging page that hopefully some of you have seen if you're actually playing with the app and you've successfully navigated to the next page. This is the home page with a to-do list of so things to do. There's patients to triage, there's CTs, um, pet CTs to look at, and, and so on. This very difficult to read exactly what's on there, but this is what we're calling a decision point page. It's basically, it shows you all the results you've got. The referral letter lets you add some notes about clinical history and comorbidities. And at the bottom, you can see the list of different investigations you can um, request all on one page instead of those 15 systems. This is just one system. Proof of concept still. We haven't actually integrated it into the trust. We've got it on our web server to, um, uh, outside of the trust to actually just build, build this with fake patient data. But it's something that actually works and you can try today if you like. 
Something else we've been thinking about, not available on the demo at the moment, is a WhatsApp within the actual um, app itself, within the lung cancer app, where pa patient-specific messaging would be stored in one place instead of emails that get lost between different people and so on. It's all stored for one patient, and you can see the conversations that you've had for this one patient. And then you can use push notifications, and uh, who's going to talk about this? Nick's going to be talking a bit about how we're using push notifications or how we set things up so you can use push notifications where when a results back has been automatically found and then gets pinged to the clinician who's who's looking after that patient and say it's back do you want to actually look at it you can do it on your on your phone probably not all the details be easy to see on your phone but this is a react um uh single web page application that works on phones and also on desktops and so on so you can actually use it on the phone but of course it's a smaller screen uh the middle thing there showing that um what the result of that pet ct was and the one on the right is showing, you know, that's an outcome successfully you've booked to the next request in eBus. Now, what we want to do as well is something called patient information videos. I actually have every time you book a request, let's say a PET CT, a patient is sent either an SMS or an email that has a link to a video that takes them th through a virtual um, tour of actually the PET CT or whatever it is you requested. Um, and, you know, take you through to the front of the hospital, the reception desk, the corridor, straight to the machine. You know, a whole video built for the patient. Another thing that we're going to be building is something what we're calling a graphical representation of pathway GRP. It's basically showing how far the patient is along the pathway. Are they coming up to their 62 day breach? And you can see for uh, Jeff Church, he's at 72 days breach. But you can see what happened at each stage of uh, the, the patient's pathway. There's a CT that's happened, uh, that they're waiting for MDT. And you can, we haven't decided on color coding yet, but you could have colors that show actually this hasn't been, this decision point hasn't been happening for a while. And maybe it's happening all the time. It's a specific point in each, all patient pathways. I think that would quite easily be good for audit to actually find bottlenecks and improve the, the, the speed of the whole pathway. Further ideas, notes section, MDT. We haven't figured out how we're going to optimize MDT digitally speaking because I haven't seen anything out there yet that has done it. And uh, this is something, this is one of the next big problems we're going to tackle is how can we make uh, MDTs, so the multidisciplinary team meetings, just better digitally with digital um, transformation involved with that? We want to have graphs and statistics built in audit functionality and abilities to upload this data. So long cancer needs to be uploaded to national um, uh, uh, databases to actually, and I think there's money involved with that as well. So why can't we actually just automate all that? Because at the moment, there's someone doing it manually. Um, where all this work is aligning, well, we're aligning with the GERF, so the get it right, um, get it, um, right first. Um, also the national... Uh, I can remember how to, uh, what the name is, Optimal Lung Cancer Pathway, and also the NHS Server Manual, aligning with all of this as much as we can. We want to do something here that other people can benefit from and is aligning with, you know, uh, higher up strategies. And as Mark um, Thurston was saying earlier, um, why not build it once? And, I would, you know, I would say share many, open source it. It's all the same, all, even different cancer pathways, even different diseases, it's all the same. A patient is referred to you, they're seen in clinic, they have some tests, they have some biopsies, you explain what's going on, and then they have treatment. It's, they're all the same. So that's what we're trying to do is the bare bones uh, that can be used for all different diseases here. Um, so we want to build faster pathways to improve patient prognosis, better patient experience through those patient information videos, reduce staff workload, improve staff, ex staff experience um, by user, using user-centered design. And as I said, aligning with NHS um, national digital strategies. So over to Nick. Um, hi, um, yeah, I'm Nick. I'm a computing student at the University of Gloucestershire on placement for this year. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a bit about the build first. Um, we're doing kind of like an agile-ish way of working. Um, this is more just to keep us on track, you know, so we're trying to increment every single week. Um, so whenever we have like new user experience designs or concepts, we're showing them to users, we're getting feedback, we're incrementing on it. Um, yeah, so, um, and we have like a, a CICD, a continuous integration development pipeline set up. So we're constantly trying to improve things with regular show and tell. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have an organization on GitHub. You can see where we're at, um, all warts and all. Uh, so you look for Spirit and Duo on GitHub. Uh, we're keeping a build diary, uh, which is good for learning. Um, hopefully um, you guys will find it interesting <clears throat> to figure out um, the sort of kind of the blind alleys we went down, the mistakes and pitfalls and how we've learned really, which is like the main thing about this because um, 
it's very important that we all share this knowledge and we all, we all learn. Um, we've shown this system a couple of times now at stakeholders meeting locally, where the let's talk to the digital conference to get feedback. Um, yeah, so we're just trying to get a good user experience with lots of feedback from clinicians. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the current digital architecture. As you can see, um, we have like a front end app that's um, we're planning to deploy into people's computers. And we have um, a back end app, um, which is all written in Python. And the main concept here is that um, this should not be like a silo. So um, in order to integrate this into in any kind of clinical site, any kind of trust, you would need to write an adapter to integrate that into the hospital trust. So it's not like a silo with its own thing and all the problems that entails. So um, it's very important that this is shared widely. Um, um, yeah. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to talk about just this this section here, uh, just just the front end. Um, and Joe will come on and talk about the back end afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. Right. Yeah, so the front end stack. Um, so yeah, this is basically where we're at. Uh, we've got a single page application, progressive web application. We're writing it in TypeScript, not Python. I'll explain a bit about that. And uh, these are some of the components uh, like Storybook, Redux, Apollo. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so TypeScript. And you're thinking, why am I learning about TypeScript or JavaScript at a Python kind of event? Um, so if you're making like um, uh, an application, some kind of web application uh, with a Python API server and you want to deploy something to a user's browser, um, you're, you're probably going to have to write JavaScript realistically. Um, so um, you know, this is a, a model for making uh, web applications is you have a front end usually written in TypeScript, JavaScript or Flow, and then you have some kind of application server. In our context, our application server is like an API gateway with business logic that is written in Python. Uh, so for those that aren't aware, TypeScript is like a type, say, a type checked version of JavaScript that transpiles to JavaScript. Um, so um, it does static type checking, but there's, because it transpiles to JavaScript, there's no runtime type information. Um, which means unlike Python, you can get runtime type coercion where you like combine a string and an integer. Um, but the type, the, the the static type checking should help pick up a lot of those errors before you actually get to runtime. Uh, next next slide, please. So yeah, we're building a we're building it as a progressive web application, which means that it can be downloadable. You can install it on your desktop and get push notifications as Mark shown. Um, but also in because we're using it. We're, we're using a front end framework, it's going to be a single page application. So what this means is that it's a static bundle of files that's um, sent to the user's web browser and then it executes inside their web browser. And what this means is that the back end API written in Python is completely separate from the front end view. You have a good separation of concerns there. And yeah, so it's just a static bundle that executes inside the browser process and renders the view that the user sees. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we use React, which is a component framework developed by Facebook. Um, and so that what that means is, is that as well as all the regular HTML elements you're used to for making things appear in a web browser, you can define your own custom elements. Um, it's written in this format called JSX, which is basically JavaScript and XML. Um, and um, yeah, so for, for these custom components that you make in React, um, they have like a life cycle basically where the component gets mounted into the browser DOM into the document object model. Uh, it updates while it's there on screen and then it gets unmounted. But then this is kind of creates a problem of how do you um, update these components? So um, React uses what's called a virtual DOM. So it tracks changes to the to, to these components and then it only updates the actual browser DOM, what you see on screen when those components um, actually update. And the way that this is managed is through these lifecycle me methods known as hooks. So say, for example, if you have a list of patients and you want that patient list to update every 30 seconds, what you would do in JavaScript is you, add a, you would have a, an interval method, like a polling method that updates every 30 seconds. But then when that list goes away, how do you clean up that side effect, right? Um, and this is a big problem in, in JavaScript. And you can create these, web, these dynamic web pages that have all these side effects and you lose track of them. So um, React has an effect hook, which is a method, and you put your side effect inside that effect hook with the cleanup, so React knows when this component goes away, it has to clean up the side effect. Same for the state hook. So you might have a patient view and you might want to track the state of that patient inside that view. And React knows with, because of the state hook that um, every time the state of that patient changes, the view has to change. And when the, the, the component's gone away, it has to just get rid of it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we use GraphQL uh, to, as, as the main um, API between um, the front end and the back end. So um, 
Uh, we, we do this because it solves a big problem for us, right? So we don't want, like I said before, we don't want this to be a silo. This is like a big problem in all these like little apps that get developed is that they end up being silos. Um, so the, the back end should have our business logic in it, but it also should be a gateway to other trust systems, right? And so the way to abstract all that away is GraphQL. And what that means is you have a single API endpoint. And here we have an example of a query where you want to get a patient and you want like the hospital identifier, the first name, last name, but then you might also want like their last test result in this view, just in this list so you can see it. Um, and these can be like related entities and you can just query the graph basically, the query the schema and get it all back into a single data object. So that way the front end doesn't care. You don't have to write a million rest endpoints that you all have to query all at once and it gets really complicated. Just do it through GraphQL, hide all that complexity in the back end. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so we were fortunate coming into this project that we had a good set of wireframes. Like I said, Mark had already been working on this before we arrived. So he had already knew from the clinicians kind of what he wanted it to look like. Um, so we started on that. And then we got support from NHSX um, who um, hooked us up with a UX designer. So the current design you see for the demonstration, uh, that's that's thanks to NHSX and their, and their UX support. Um, yeah, and um, something something else they told us about and puts onto is these NHS React components. So like I said, we're using React as our front end uh, framework, and there's a standard set of components um, that uses the NHS style sheets. So you're probably aware that there are these NHS CSS style sheets for styling your website, and it takes those style sheets and integrates these into standardized components. Like you can see here an input, it's probably quite small actually, with a standardized error message. And so that saves us the work of having to you know, make make it look like everything else. So we just reuse this component. We tell the component, hey, the user, there's an error on this input. It will display the error in a standard location. So if you're used to using NHS websites, um, it will just automatically look and feel like an NHS website because we're just reusing those standard components. And this, these these components are great. I would highly recommend you use them if you're doing anything on the front end and you want to you, you use React because um, then you just, you just get the standard NHS look and feel basically for free. It's really good. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so in terms of testing, um, we're using this library called React Testing Library. And it's, an, it's this based on this a, a, a philosophy of access, accessibility first. Um, and it's like, um, so testing the behavior. So if you click on a patient, do you get the model, the model view of that patient, which is how our application currently works. You click on a patient in the list, you get a modal view of it. Um, and the, the way the testing library works is that rather than doing what are called individual DOM selectors, like selecting individual HTML elements, you use um, ARIA, accessibility rich internet application selectors. So you, you look for a button, you look for an input, right? These are the things that if you use a dictation or a screen reader, these are the things that that program, that accessibility, you know, those assistive tools will look for. So what this means is, is because any new software you write that user interact with has to be accessible. It's a legal requirement because of the Equality Act. And it means we're, we're at least aiming in that direction because all of our automated testers are based on these accessibility selectors. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, and also Storybook. This is another great tool. This works not just with React, but also with Vue um, and I think Next.js and all these front end frameworks. It's a component visualization system. So what it means is you can live develop a component in isolation from the rest of the system validate the states, like here is a patient list with the locked state. You would again have it in the unlocked state. You would write all your tests around it. And then when you were happy with how it looks and how it behaves in isolation, you can then just use it in the rest of your system. Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, oh yeah, so now I'm passing things. Um, I hope that explains the front end um, things. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Joe, who's gonna explain how things work on the Python backend, which is um, yeah, what, what you're all here for. Hey, Joe, where did Joe go? Hello. Here he is. Hi. Um, hi, thanks Nick. Um, thanks everyone for having me. I'm, I'm Joe. I'm a placement student working with Mark and Nick at Gloucester Hospitals. I'm a cybersecurity student at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, I'll be discussing our backend architecture, how we got there, some of the issues that we've encountered along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Our backend stats gone through a couple of iterations. So as a project, uh, as a project developed, we, the requirements change. We have to move from synchronous components to asynchronous components to facilitate the things like data loaders because they're they were they're asynchronous and moved the ASGI specification over the WSGI specification. Uh, next slide, please. We chose Python, obviously. Um, we all three of us have got varying degrees of experience with it. It works on any mainstream platform. It can facilitate anything that we can throw at it, and it's relatively easy to learn, so we can get other people involved. 
it's also there's obviously a great community behind it. Adding on quickly to it being easy to learn, that's really important for us. Sorry, um, it's really important for us because it means we can get other clinicians involved and other students involved because we're only here for uh, this year. I think we've only got six months left. Uh, next slide, please. Ariadne is a GraphQL server implementation for Python. Um, it uses a schema first implementation, which means we write the schema first and write the resolvers for the relevant data types and queries after. This is a benefit over the bottom up approach like Graphene, which is another GraphQL server implementation. We can start to visualize the entire schema before we start building queries. Um, Ariadne also works with any Python web framework, um, meaning if we have to change frameworks as we did to begin with, um, it doesn't cause a major headache. We started using Graphene, um, but we encountered issues with it because it's synchronous, and we we moved so we moved to uh, Ariadne because it's inherent, it's fully asynchronous. As opposed to RESTful endpoints, GraphQL queries effectively choose the data they need in the form of a JSON query, meaning queries can be reused without having to fetch necessary data from like RESTful endpoints. Uh, next slide, please. Starlet is a lightweight ASGI framework. Um, it's the asynchronous brother of WSGI. Uh, WSGI is a common web framework for Python web applications, but it isn't asynchronous, and asynchronous, asynchrony is much better for scalable applications. Starlet runs our REST endpoints, the GraphQL endpoint, and WebSocket endpoints, so everything, all, everything on the back end runs through Starlet. It's really simple, but it's got all the basic utilities we need for a web application. We found it really quite easy to work with because the docs are great, and it's really just simple to get engaged with. We initially started using Django, however, we had issues because it's, uh, I think the ORM is synchronous, and when we try to mix asynchrony in with it, it somehow starts returning the wrong data. Um, so we can either fix that or be um, switched to Ariadne and fully rely on the fact that it's fully asynchronous. So we did. Uvicorn is our ASGI server, in, server implementation. Starlet's just a framework. It doesn't include the server. Um, Starlet runs the ASGI as a web server, so Nginx can connect to it. It also works as a process manager, so it's able to run multiple processes in parallel and take advantage of multiple processes, processes sorry, which again is really important for scalable applications. Next slide, please. I'm running through this really quick because I'm acutely aware of running out of time. Uh, data loaders are components designed by Facebook to deal with large volumes of traffic because they've got quite a massive web presence. The Python port that we're using is AIO data loader. It allows, allows us to batch and cache queries and their results. There have been a couple of occasions where we've had to query the same data source twice. Um, I can't remember where, but this is this is a remedy for that. It just removes some of the overhead. Similarly, with batching queries, if we batch them all in one, we don't have to send loads of little requests. It just removes some of the overhead. Um, it also provides a uniform a uniform API when we're getting data from different sources. So, for example, in our in our software, we are pulling data from our local Postgres database as well as from our fake trust system. Next slide, please. You. The request workflow unit is a concept that we've developed to describe a step in the patient's diagnostic pathway. A uh, decision point is a term that we've used to describe when a patient has tests or scans requested based off previous test or uh, previous test result or data. An RWU is effectively how two decision points are linked together. This is really important to our project as we're able to apply this to other diagnostic pathways for other disease sites and organizations. So it's quite a you quite a universal thing for diagnostic pathways. Next slide, please. This is a view of a series. Uh, um, this is a view of request workflow units in series and parallel to form an example pathway for a lung cancer patient. We can see that some request workflow units affect the pathway immediately and some don't. In this example, the PET CT influences the pathway immediately because depending on the results of that, you might, you might need to order one of uh, one of two things. Whereas something like the lung function workflow doesn't affect something immediately so it can run in parallel. Um, but it will have an effect at the end because if, if depending on the results of long function workflow, it might affect patients' viability for surgery. Next slide, please. The trust adapter, this is this is kind of this is really, really key to what we're doing. So it's a Python module that we've designed that acts as an interface between our systems and trust and organization systems to provide a layer of separation. It means that if you wanted to take our software and use it in a different trust or a different organization. Only the trust adapter would need to be changed. You don't have to go about messing around uh, editing the the back end of the back end of our software. So it makes things slightly simpler um, using it in different applications. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. We are using Postgres. 
as our uh, local backend database because it's highly available, it's free, it's open source, and it's multi-platform. It's also highly compliant to SQL standards. The backend uses Geno, which is a Python library for object relational mapping. It uses it uses SQL Alchemy to build queries conveniently and handles the database connection pool too. We found this is really helpful in building larger queries because it's more manageable than writing more queries, especially if you don't have an in-depth understanding of SQL. Um, so it's quite easy to get started, which again is really important getting other people involved. They don't need to learn full new languages. They just need to have a uh, basic concept. Next slide, please. Our, we've employed CICD, continuous integration and continuous delivery on our workflows and GitHub Actions. Whenever a commit is tried to push to our main branch, this workflow kicks off. The CI workflow consists of front end and back end tests. This is important for big merges to make sure that, no, that nothing's broken. This is obviously really dependent on good test coverage. You've got poor test coverage, the, the CI workflow won't necessarily pick up any, anything that's broken. Our CD workflow compiles a production build of the front end of the back end containers removing development dependencies and for the back end container it runs the it configures the container to run as a non root user um, just for security it pushes the updated docker images and deploys them on our staging server where we, where we can run through everything and eventually deploy to our production demo server this gives us a good amount of time because that's to do with manually at the each event, uh, at the end of each sprint it just kind of it just helps things move along our ci pipeline does help the clinical safety by ensuring that everything's safe and working to our standards according to our tests so as long as our test coverage is very good. We can be we can be quite sure that the software is working as intended. Next slide, please. Uh, that's my view of the back end. I think we're taking questions. Thank you very much.